Okay, well, um, in the absence of our um, uh, the person who agreed to chair the session, I'll I'll step in as chair for the moment. Um, so, hi everyone, welcome to uh, Amaldi fifteen session fifteen A dash three uh, test of general relativity. Uh, our first speaker. Oh, hold on, let me pull this back up. Sorry, I had I had the program open and then it, it closed on me. All right. Um, our first speaker is Hiroki Takeda uh, from Kyoto University in Japan. Um, so Hiroki, please take it away. OK, so let's start. So uh, hello, everyone. So, uh, so it's 9, yeah, 7 p.m., 7 a.m. in Japan. So. Uh, I'm Hiroki Takeda from Kyoto University. So today, uh, I would like to discuss the uh, uh, detectability of scalar polarizations in gravitational wave signals from compact binaries. So yeah, this talk is based on the, this recent paper. So first, the uh, GR is widely accepted as a standard, uh, standard theory of gravity in the standard cosmological model through the um, experiments and observations in the weak and the short uh, gravitational regions. So as this figure shows, so this figure shows the X uh, the uh, regions where the GR has been tested. So X axis shows the gravitational potential, and Y axis shows the shows the space time curvature. So, however, the GR has some uh, several unresolved issues such as dark matter, dark energy, and unification of the quantum and the gravity. So many alternative theories of gravity has been proposed to overcome such problems. So we must test theories of gravity in extreme environments such as strong fields and long scales. The gravitational waves from compact binary core sensors are generated in the strong fields so strong fields and then propagate long distances and then we can observe them with gravitational wave telescopes such as LIGO, Virgo and Kagura detected. So the observation of gravitational waves from compact binaries uh, realize such tests of extreme gravity. So there are uh, various methods for testing GR. So here we focus on the polarizations Polarization modes are physical degrees of freedom of gravitational waves. So as you know, um, uh, gravitational waves can have two tensor polarizations in general relativity. So tensor two tensor polarizations, but uh, generic metric theories of gravity allows up to additional four polarization degrees of freedom, two vector modes, two scalar modes, breathing and longitudinal mode. Um, this figure shows the motion of test particles arranged on the circle by each polarization passing through in plus C direction. Uh, detector signal can be written as a linear combination of polarization modes, so antenna pattern functions and polarization modes. Antenna pattern functions represent the detector response to each polarization mode. And, uh, and the polarization modes can be defined the uh, uh, so-called polarization basis like this. And so polarization separation requires at least at many, as many as detectors as polarization modes. But uh, the, the properties of the polarization modes uh, reflects the nature of the theory of gravity, so such as um, um, uh, additional field, additional field or um, breaking the break of the Rolet sim, uh, sim breaking of the gauge symmetry, something like this. So that by entangling the polarizations in the gravitational wave signal, we can test the general, general relativity and the alternative theories of gravity. So this is a map of polarization test so far. So here we focus on the chop signal. So in the chop, in the case of chop signal, so there are two complementary methods. So with, with waveform predictions, without waveform prediction. So here we uh, consider the uh, former case, so with waveform prediction case. So in this approach, uh, this approach, the feature of this approach is the high sensitivity, and that we can get give some direct constraint on the theoretical parameters. 
the because uh, this approach is based on the uh, Bayesian inference with some waveform predictions. But so of course, so this approach is should be moderate dependent to some extent. So the uh, using the web, some uh, GR GR like templates, the so scalar polarizations have been actively searched for uh, so far. However, the experiment in the on the other hand, the experiment in the solar system gave the tight tight constraint on the couplings. So the question is the scalar mode in the gravitational wave is suppressed or not? So uh, based on the this um, constraint of the coupling. So here we discuss the detectability of scalar polarization mode with uh, GR templates. GR templates means uh, luminal proportions and uh, without wave uh, frequency dependent wave deformations. So here we for taking uh, we taking into account the uh, generation process and propagation process, observation process, whole whole uh, detection process. So at the stage of the generation process. We um, consider the constraint on the energy loss by gravitational wave observations. And so uh, at the stage of the propagation, so we consider the possibility of amplification of the scalar, uh, some polarizations during the long cosmological long distance propagation. And the start, the last three at the stage of the observations, so we consider the constraint on the coupling by local gravity test. So first we focus on the generation. So we will estimate the possible possible energy of the scalar modes at generation process. So the extra energy loss due to additional polarization, anomalous polarizations, disturb the motion of uh, binary motion or the phase evolution of the gravitational waves. So this figure shows uh, such constraints. So this the energy loss from the binary system can be written like this. So this E dot GR represents uh, that in GR and BQ is a phenomenological parameter um, denoting the deviation from the GR case. And this figure shows a constraint on this BQ. So X axis shows a um, post-Newtonian order and Y axis shows a constraint to BQ. And this figure shows uh, uh, the constraint on the deviation of the energy loss uh, at the most that of tensor modes. So it means uh, energy carried by scalar mode at generation is at most that of tensor modes as far as we consider the, as far as we do not observe the large deviation in the phase, uh, gravitational wave phase evolution. So next, oh, we consider the, um, and so, but even if there is no significant emission at the stage of generation, so it may be possible that it is amplified during the propagation process. So here we focus, here we shall consider the possibility of amplification of scalar modes during propagation. So we write general propagating modes with full polarization modes uh, like this. So this Hij is a metric perturbation and can be uh, it's expressed as uh, phi in terms of phi i and Hijji. So phi i is a propagating mode. So currently normalized propagating mode, and this Hijji is um, a polarization basis for each uh, propagating mode i. And this propagating basis propagating basis can be expressed as a. Uh, is uh, expressed as uh, uh, in terms of the coupling and the standard polarization tensor. So combining this, so we can write the metric perturbations in terms of the phi and the coupling. So the uh, HA, the, each polarization is obtained uh, is obtained by this these combinations. So the independent propagating modes. So here phi i. So are locally written as a linear combination of polarization modes. So here we consider because we consider here we consider the coupling of the scalar polarization, coupling polarization modes. So, but we show that the propagating modes this phi i can be safely assumed to be canonically normalized. So under uh, assumption that additional scalar modes are detected simultaneously 
with uh, standard tensor using the GR waveform templates. So, I mean, the, uh, here we assume the uh, luminal propagation of the scalar polarizations and uh, without uh, any wave frequency, in the frequency dependent wave deformation. So, under these assumptions, so we can conclude that the amplitude of polarization modes made changes, but that of the energy flux hardly changes during propagations. So here, after we will prove, prove the statement. The general quadratic action would be given by like this. So this um, quadratic part and uh, B part and C part. And these A and B and C are slowly changing backgrounds. And the A is uh, for reality of the, uh, the action. So we can find the uh, A should be symmetric space time tensor and element, and B should be space time vector and anti element, and C should be a space time scalar and element. And the A part can be decomposed is a part proportional to G menu and the reminder part. Then the equation motion under adiabatic um, condition reduced to this equation motions. And this C tilde is the background quantities uh, expressed as like this. So delta A and B part C and C part. And we solve this equation. We needed to solve this equation motion perturbatively along the path of the gravitational wave using a WKB and that. So this phi hat is um, uh, slowly burning uh, Amplitude, and so here k mu is um um yeah for for wave number vector. So where we expand the this phi at um u in terms of u and v. So we needed to determine this u and v, uh, first order and second order. So for the uh, as for the seats as for the u, so we find the formal solution. So like this, so, and each part, so this C tilde has a delta A part, B part, and C part, and each part contributes phase uh, as, so this A delta A gives a um, phase proportional to omega linearly. So it causes a time shift among um, propagating modes. And this B part is, uh, causes a um, uh, phase shift. So it's, which is um, uh, frequency independent. And the C causes uh, omega inverse uh, frequency independent waveform deformations. So in our assumptions, so we can observe these, uh, uh, we can observe the uh, common type shift and uh, phase, phase shift. So with the uh, uh, GR template search. So large phase caused by uh, delta A is proportional to I, Ij, and uh, uh, any B mu Ij seems to be allowed in our assumptions. So next we consider the um, next order. We also find the formal solution. Hiroki, um, just, yeah. just a minute or so left, All right? Yeah, sorry. So yeah, we also find the formal solution under this uh, expressions. So, and the delta, so this is a, a possible contribution. But so this part uh, causes the uh, omega zero amplifications and omega omega linear phase shift. So we can observe this delta A part, but the B, P, I, B mu Ij has a frequency dependent uh, wave deformations. So we cannot observe this uh, with uh, GR templates. So the energy flux cannot be altered without waveform deformation, except for the effect of usual redshift and gravitational lensing, because this is a, the um, standard gravitational lensing effect. And we so so in early, so we shall consider the constraint from the experiment in the solar system. The extra scalar polarization was the mediate fifth source. So the for the massless field, the Cassini satellite gives the tight, tight, tightest constraint on the PPN parameter. So this is a question, how is the coupling of the scalar mode with matter constraint? So we assume the universal coupling. So the, um, the under this coupling, so the metric perturbation in the synchronous gauge would be given by like this with Green's functions. And from the symmetry of the Green's functions, so we can write the G in terms of the invariant tensor 
a1, a2, and a3, a4, a5 are coefficients. So here we assume the presence of only one extra scalar propagating mode, so plus mode, cross mode, and scalar mode. So by these assumptions, we can find uh, these uh, coefficients a. And so for the st uh, static, stick, and symmetric matter field, so we can get the uh, this expression for the PPN parameter in terms of the coupling. So um, based on the uh, Cassini, Cassini constraints, so we can get the we can find the, the coupling are strongly constrained. The possible amplitude of the scalar mode is comparable to the detection limit. So this is a um, uh, important result in our work. So this HS is a scalar polarization integration signal and the Psi S is the energy of the uh, scalar polarization, which is constrained by the considerations and at the stage of the generation and the propagation phase. And the theta s is uh, constrained by the uh, fifth source experiment like this. So this is the conclusion. It is difficult to de detect the scalar polarizations modes with a single detector under our assumptions. So however, so, uh, this is a summary. So however, the uh, possible scenario of scalar detection still remains by breaking us our, our assumptions. I, we are planning to uh, tackle such problems in next stage. So. Thank you for your attention. All right, uh, thank you, Hiroki, for this talk. Uh, we have a couple minutes for questions. Uh, so if, if you have a question, please uh, please raise your hand and, and I'll call on you. Okay. Um, well, if there if there are no questions, uh, we can move on to the next talk. Um, all right. Thank you again for uh, Hiroki for this talk. Thank you. All right. Let me share my screen. Uh, yes. Yeah. Go ahead. Wait. Can you see my screen? Yes. Yep. All right. So uh, next up is uh, Juan Yang uh, uh, from Perimeter Institute uh, in Canada. Um, so please take it away. Yeah. Thank you, Aaron. Um, hello, everyone. So today I'm going to discuss this resonance of uh, extreme mass ratio in sparrows. Uh, I'll, I'll explain what they are. Uh, but right now I'm in a hotel room so please bear with me if if the uh, network gets unstable <clears throat> okay so we know that uh this gravitational wave observation from ground-based detectors has achieved tremendous tremendous amount of success we have detected over 100 uh stellar mass uh compact object mergers so in the dec next decade or so we should expect that um, a new window will open in this mini hertz band by the space space detectors such as ELISA. So for LISA, uh, two main extragalactic sources are these supermassive black hole binaries and these extreme mass ratio in spirals that I'll focus on today. So these extreme mass ratio in spirals basically are made by uh, uh, a galactic center, usually a supermassive black hole plus a stellar mass object. So this stellar mass object can be a, a black hole or it can be a neutron star or some white dwarf, let's say, some compact objects. Okay, so because Lisa band Right, like it's roughly from a millihertz to uh, 0.1 hertz or so. So there is uh, a range of mass that we can probe. So, so in this case, we probe uh, the mass range for the supermassive black hole will be roughly 10 to the 5 to 10 to the 7 solar mass. Okay. Um, 
so this kind of source is but is very interesting because uh they typically stay in the lisa band for many cycles let's say ten thousand or hundred thousand cycles so that means we have during the whole observation time we have 10 to 5 or 10 to 6 radiant uh, in the band <clears throat> So let's imagine there is a very small perturbation to the system, let's say with order uh, 10 to the minus six. Over these many cycles, this very small perturbation may accumulate and eventually generate a one order one radiant phase change. And order one radiant is probably observable already uh, uh, with gravitational wave detection. So that means these emeries are indeed ideal tools for measuring these small perturbations. And this offers us very nice opportunities for studying, let's say, small perturbations from it, the Emory environment, or it can come from unknown um, <clears throat> fundamental physics. Okay. Uh, so you may ask, let's say, considering the environmental effects, so, so what kind of effects can uh, generate a, a space-time, right? That's a bit different from Kerr, right? Uh, so there are at, at least several interesting scenarios. <clears throat> For example, uh, if we have a Emory system, which is has a supermassive black hole and uh, uh, and a uh, supermassive black hole and a star mass black hole. Let's say this one is a star mass black hole. But then we can have a third body near the system, right? So the third body generates a, a perturbative gravitational, gravitational field for the Emory system. So that could be the age the, uh, in this problem. So the total metric deviates from curve. Or one can imagine that uh, there is some uh, super radiant action cloud generated by this rotating supermassive black hole. And if the cloud mass, if the axon particle mass is in the right range, this cloud mass can be as high as 10% of the, the, the supermassive black hole mass. So it's quite a lot. And this cloud would definitely generate a perturbation to the curve space, cur, uh, space time. Or uh, many people are studying like Braho mimickers. The, the Braho mimickers can be almost as compact as Braho's, but they may have different set of multiple moments from Braho's. That means the external metric may deviate from Kerr as well. So this is also an interesting scenario. Okay, so all these cases, even if the deviation from Kerr is small, we are hoping that we can use Emory's to probe these small deviations. Um, theoretically, right? So if the space time is curved, then we imagine that we um, uh, there is three conserved quantities, so motions are separable, and then uh, uh, then we can, can completely solve it. But if we have small perturbations, there is this so-called CAM theorem telling us that the motion should be uh, oscillating around the uh, curve geodesics. So in that sense, it still can be understood. Except that in this scenario, which we call, call it as resonance, well, these optical frequencies, right, in theta R and phi directions, the commensurate here, the K and, and M are integer numbers. So if you combine them and you find these frequencies sum up to be almost like uh, almost zero, that that's a resonance. So in this bottom plot, some have some orbits like for the non-resonant geodesics. So if we project the geodesics like in the R theta plane, we see that as time goes on, the trajectory almost occupy the whole plane, right? So this is a non-resonance. But if it's a resonance orbit, like for example here on the right. If you see a three, two resonance and you project it in this R theta plane, you see that the orbit is just closed. Okay. It's, uh, and crossing this kind of resonance is very general for typical uh, evolutions. Typically, we will 
across uh, multiple resonances. Okay, so now this CAM theorem breaks down. Okay, it's a mathematically it's a mathematical theorem, but it breaks down near the resonance. So the orbit no longer de like oscillates just around these geodesics. In fact, uh, we, in many cases, we expect the emergence of chaos uh, uh, in, in this resonance regime. So this is a very typical feature of these non-integrable systems. So there are many previous works on the, this phenomenology of chaos in the perturbed curve space times. So if we try to summarize, we can, uh, we have three kinds of orbits. So the first kind of orbit are these island orbits. And if we compute the, the ratio between the frequencies in this island, the ratio is constant. For example, this two, three resonance, the ratio is two over three for this exactly two over three in this. So you see a plateau, okay? And very far away from the resonance, this O1 uh, orbit, there are non-resonant orbits, the ratios are, quite different from two over three. But in the middle, we have this O2, these chaotic orbits in the middle, okay? So they can have very complicated behavior in the phase space. Uh, they kind of sit in the middle between the non-resonant and uh, the islands. So people have have uh, studied this kind of problem in very space time. This is uh, what generally, generically the, what they find. And now the important question is, are can we get a unified framework to describe this resonant dynamics? So apparently, if there is a non-zero H, the dynamics is quite complicated from the phase space diagram we just saw. And like with that, how if we add the radiation reaction, uh, how does the dynamics change? Right. And eventually, can we use this knowledge to derive or uh, obtain the emery waveform. Okay, so if we have the emery waveform, then we can use it to measure H, to measure the deviation from the curve. Okay, so these are the important questions. And um, so what we essentially did is to uh, develop a, a Hamiltonian approach uh, for generic uh, perturbations. So we had a Hamiltonian that contains uh, the curve space time, but we have also have H. <clears throat> so we are deriving the equation motion using this action angle variables. The Q is angle and J are the actions. So there is part correspond to geodesics. There are correspond, part correspond to the perturbed Hamiltonian generated by H, okay? And then we also Fourier decompose this perturbed Hamiltonian into different harmonics. Um, so near resonance, when these frequencies are commensurate with each other, right, we can define a resonant angle Q, which is like this. I mean, apparently Q dot is this summation of frequencies is almost zero. That means Q very, very, very changes very slowly in time. In fact, this resonant angle Q evolve in a time scale that's roughly slower than the usual time scale by a square root of epsilon, that's square root of H, okay? So it's a slow, it's a slow time, uh, but other degrees freedom just vary in the orbital time scale is a fast time. So we can, uh, after some mathematical procedures, we can uh, effectively remove all the fast time scales and we can derive a fact Hamiltonian for this single resonant degree of freedom Q. And this is a Hamiltonian. It looks already quite simple. Theta is a, is a conjugate momentum for the action for the angle Q. And uh, here is a phase diagram. So, so on the right-hand side is a phase diagram for the resonant degrees of freedom, Q versus conjugate momentum theta. So it turns out that this looks very similar to the phase diagram of a pendulum. So if you imagine there's a pendulum and theta is an angle, 
And if the energy of pendulum is small, it just oscillates around the equilibrium position. So the value of theta is bounded. So it's similar to this resonant island orbits here. So there is a, uh, the, the, the Q just move like in a small interval. But as we increase the energy, the pendulum uh, amplitude, oscillation amplitude increases. And eventually when the energy is very large, the pendulum starts to rotate like over two pi. And these are the, this so-called rotation orbits. Okay, you see that there is a critical energy that you switch from this oscillation to a rotation. So, so uh, qualitatively, this pendulum uh, gives a very good uh, insight on what ha what's happening here. And numerically, we also evolve the whole system, like the Emory system, which contains three degrees of freedom. We evolve everything uh, numerically, but then we project the motion uh, in this single degree of freedom. And, and indeed, we find very good agreement with this single degree of freedom of Hamiltonian, this effective Hamiltonian description. So numerically, you see, we find this non-resonant orbit here. So it's like the rotation orbit here. I mean, it's not just the qualitative, we look the same. They, we, we check numerically, they look exactly the same, okay? And this oh, three, island- Three minutes left. Okay, these islands, and then the islands are the same. But then we also see these, there occasionally there are orbits that follow this rotation orbit, but they jumps from between branches. These are chaotic orbits, but this is not explained by the Hamiltonian. So we think what's going on is that that's because we have neglected fast change in um, terms in the Hamiltonian. And this is usually fine, but uh, uh, but in outside this resonant, uh, re resonant islands, if you include these terms, this can actually give you the chaos. So it is known that in the pendulum example, if you add this fast changing terms, people know understand how this give rise to chaos. Okay. Um, okay. So so what if we add the gravitational radiation reaction back in. So in that case, there are two important time scales in this problem. One time scale is the, the orbital period for the motion in uh, in this uh, QC plane. So the, the circulation time scale for the re resonant time degree freedom. And there is another time scale that's how fast this orbit evolves across in this uh, resonant regime according to radiation reaction. So there is another time scale. So in the adiabatic limit, when the radiation reaction is small, and um, we can exactly understand the evolution of the uh, orbit, and we can show that it's unlikely that the orbit will be captured into any of these islands. But in the non-adiabatic limit, we uh, this capture into these islands are possible. Okay. So I'm skipping a lot of details, but uh, it's all possible. So, so effective Hamiltonian made all these arguments possible. Okay, eventually if we have this Hamiltonian and radiation reaction, we can discuss what's going on for the Emory dynamics. So physically what's happening for the resonant crossing is that the system will receive additional kick in conserved quantities such as and the angular momentum and cut the constant across in this resonance. And this, this secular change in conserved quantities will be remembered in the evolution later on, and it will generate long-term long -term defacing. And, and we also worked out this uh, change in the, um, in the Emory phase in the long term in this to regimes in the non adiabatic regime is proportional to h divided by the mass ratio uh, to 1.5 power, and uh, in the adiabatic regime is square to h divided by q. So, in any case, depending on the relative am amplitude, amplitude between h and the mass ratio, this delta psi can be larger than one. Okay, so I'm almost done. So, here I've described that uh, the resonant dynamics of Emery's in a perturbed space time can be described by a, a single degree freedom effect Hamiltonian. 
And we we understand why the chaos emerges in this uh, formalism. And we understand with radiation reaction included, uh, uh, how do we understand the dynamics? There are two regions, adiabatic and non-adiabatic regimes, and the phase shift, resonance induced phase shift can be derived in these two regimes. And we can use this knowledge in the future to uh, derive the Emory waveform for this perturbed curve space. Huh? Okay, uh, that's it. Thank you. Are there any questions? All right. Uh, thanks. Thanks, Juan, for this uh, this really interesting talk. Uh, yeah, if, if anyone has any questions, please please raise your hand. Okay, I, I have a question. Um, all right, so I, I'm not sure if you're your part of, or, but maybe you know of the the few package, which uh, of course is used to to calculate these orbits. Are there plans to implement this uh, in in few? Yeah, exactly. So one of my students is. Uh, working on this modification version of fuel to incorporate resonance effect. Yeah, exactly. Excellent. Great. Uh, yeah. For, for those of you who don't know, it's a it's a package used to uh, quickly calculate uh, Emory waveforms. Yeah. All right. Any any other questions? Oh, uh, Constantino. Ah, uh, yes. Uh, uh so my question is uh you you said that with this resonance you could test uh the, the care background actually the careness of the background uh my question is since this is a resonance and it would amplify any behavior can you also test the um not just the background but but the dynamical equations themselves like gr i mean yeah, not just, so, the, not just the background, but the equations themselves. Yeah, so here I'm just restricting myself to GR. It's just the background is changed. Uh, but then if your uh, if Einstein equation receive modifications, I there could be some additional force. Uh, like effectively, there is some additional force acting on this small object near resonance. Then you may imagine you may have similar behavior but that's an interesting problem to explore yeah here i'm just talking about gr yeah thanks okay uh well then let's let's move on to the next speaker okay thank you let me I'll share uh, uh, thank, thanks again for uh for giving us this talk thank you okay um our next speaker is uh constantino uh, Pasilio uh, from uh, Milano Bicocca uh, in Italy. Yeah. Uh, a difficulty that arises when you want to test GR by stacking uh, catalogs of events. And uh, this is a work in preparation with uh, Professor Davide Gerosa in Milan and uh, Shweta Parkwood in Birmingham. Uh, so let me briefly. Okay, I think I can almost skip this slide because it's almost identical to the one that was presented before. Uh, this is just to motivate the fact that uh, ground ground based detectors they, they can test strong gravity uh, and strong curvature as well. So they are a probe of gravity in the strong regime, uh, and in particular, we expect uh, that while prism detectors they they only have moderate sensitivity to modifications of gravity, but we expect that future 3G detectors will have a much higher sensitivity. And, but okay, anyway, tests of gravity are already performed uh, with uh, already with present catalogs of events by the lago Virco collaboration. And uh, so there is a whole battery of tests that is performed. Uh, and for example, you have the IMR consistency test, or for example, you check for the dispersion relation or for fractional deviations in the quasi normal mode spectrum in the ring down. And all these tests, they all share a common feature, which is that they are null tests. 
So you do not compare GR to a specific modification of gravity because you cannot, basically. We do not have a good candidate for a beyond GR theory. And also, even if we had it, we, we are not at the stage of having developed the dynamics at the level of being actually compared against GR. So uh, like a Virgo Kagra performs null tests in which you check whether some control parameters are consistent with zero, which is the GR value. I mean, they can be shifted to, uh, to impose the GR corresponds to the control parameter being equal to zero. And so uh, this just to give you an example of uh, the fact uh, the three G detectors will be able to probe gravity at exquisite precision. Uh, this is a work that we did together with Shweta Papot and uh, other collaborators this year, and and part of this work also uh, 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 went into uh, this this science case with the Earth Center Scope uh, review that was uh, released by the Einstein Telescope collaboration this year. And so in this, in this work, what we show is the number of ring down events that can be detected by a network of Einstein Telescope and Cosmic Explorer in different configurations. And what we show is that you could detect tens of thousands of events per year, where by detection, we mean that the SNR in the ring down part is larger than 12. And if you only focus on large SNR events, you still have a good fraction, even if it's much uh, less, but you still have hundreds of events per year. And then you have a bunch of events per year, uh, which will have very loud SNR. Uh, of 100 per year. I mean, when I say SNR, I, I mean SNR in the ring down part. Uh, so this is why I consider 100 as a loud SNR. Otherwise, for 3G detectors, of course, if you consider the whole IMR waveform, you could reach much higher SNRs. So what we show in this in this diagram, uh, we show the uh, fractional uncertainty on, let's say, the F330 frequency in the quasi-normal mood spectrum. Uh, and then you see that uh, there is a considerable considerable fraction of events which have uncertainty around 10%, which is similar to what LIGO, for example, can achieve with a good ring down detection. But LIGO can only achieve it for sparse events, while uh, with, with the network of 3G detectors, uh, you would achieve this regularly. And the main point here is that you would achieve it uh, for so many events that you will be able to stack all the events together to decrease the uncertainty up to the level of uh, sub percent by back of the envelope calculation. Uh, so, okay. Now, what about stacking? Uh, so there are many ways of combining events together, uh, but one popular one is called hierarchical stacking. So the idea behind hierarchical stacking is that you assume that all these uh, deviational parameters that you measure from each single event, uh, they belong to a common distribution. So basically, you use the same tools that you would use in population inference, but now you are inferring the uh, population of uh, deviations from GR within the data. And this is an example from the LIGO Virgo Kagra GR tests. Uh, this is specifically for the IMR consistency test. And uh, so they didn't find any deviation from GR, but if you found a deviation from GR, you would find a deviation in the sense that this mu and sigma, which are the hyperparameters of this distribution, would be equal to zero uh, if GR is correct. But if GR is not correct, they would deviate away from zero. So you can quantify how much you are consistent with GR by uh, basically by the quantile 
of the zero zero point within these distributions of mu and sigma. And if the quantile is sufficiently uh, far from zero and it approaches one, uh, it means that your GR point, your zero zero point is in the tail of the distribution. And then you would be tempted to claim that you have a deviation from GR, but then, uh, but then something can go wrong. And for example, okay, this is well known. What can go wrong is that you can have waveform systematics. And even if you do not uh, measure or you, you do not recognize systematics in individual events, after you stack all events together, the systematics can accumulate by combining more and more events. And then they can give rise to a forced deviation from GR. And, and of course, this is a problem that should be solved for future detectors. So waveform modeling must, must be improved uh, to, I mean, otherwise we will not be able to perform tests of GR with future detectors. And then, uh, but, but what I want to talk about in this talk is another effect, uh, which we dubbed cosmic variance. So basically, uh, you can uh, bias uh, your uh, null hypothesis test, so you can get a bias in the quantile uh, uh, and and get a quantile that approaches one. So you can you can have the GR is in the tail of your hierarchical say distribution, even if you do not have systematics. And this is because uh, the catalog has a finite size. So if if you if you are in the limit of infinite size catalogs, you would not have this effect. But due to the fact that you just have a finite number of events, uh, you can have many events, as many as you want, but they are always finite in number. Uh, then you are always exposed to the risk of uh, falsely detecting a deviation from GR, even if GR is correct, and then. Uh, how would you approach this problem? Uh, for example, you could split a catalog and you can have many subcatalogs and do an histograms of your control parameters, say of the quantile. So you can see how the quantile distributes uh, in, the, in many subcatalogs. But uh, okay, I mean, in principle, this is viable, but in practice, it's not because uh you would you would not have so many events to uh to split them in subcatalogs and still have a good statistical power you would lose statistical power too much by doing this so we tried to understand how you can approach and mitigate this problem uh in order to to expose yourself uh to not exalt to not expose yourself to a false positive when performing such uh, hierarchical tests. And this is an example of an illustration of what what, what is this cosmic variance. By the way, we dubbed, we dubbed it cosmic variance in analogy with cosmology, where it refers to the fact that you only measure one CMB. Uh, and uh, in, in, in our case, uh, the word cosmic means that you only measure the single catalog, the one that is actually realized uh, for you as an observer, you do not, you, you do not, have, you do not have, you do not have access to multiple realizations of the catalog. That's it. So, uh, so this is the toy model. Uh, so we basically simulated a large catalog of ten thousand measurements uh, for a control parameter x. A generic control parameter can be any control parameter. And we assumed that the likelihoods are all Gaussians. And for this specific toy model, we also assumed that they all have the same uncertainties. So basically, we tried to make the model as simple as possible to understand the, uh, uh, the gist of this effect. And uh, these two corner plots, they show the posteriors for mu and sigma uh for uh two different realizations of the catalog and in one realization you have that the quantile is zero which means that basically the null hypothesis is in the uh in the maximum likelihood region 
sorry, in the maximum posterior region uh, for mu and sigma. In this case, your null hypothesis is uh, outside the posterior region with the quant and so the quantile is the 98 uh, quantile. Uh, but the key point is that in both cases, uh, the underlying simulation is consistent with the null hypothesis. So for, for all events, we have that x, the true x was equal to zero. But after stacking, depending on the realization of the catalog, you can find yourself in this unlikely situation uh, in which you claim that, or you would be tempted to claim not, maybe at 0.98, you wouldn't claim that GR is necessarily wrong, but still you will start to worry a lot. Uh, so- Three, three uh, minutes left. Okay. Uh, so basic, okay, I will skip the details, but one possible solution is to use bias factors instead of, uh, instead of, instead of the quantile, uh, because bias factor is more robust, uh, than, uh, claim just reporting the quantile. So for example, if you, if you, uh, stick to the, uh, to the, uh, the practice of claiming a decisive bias factor when uh, the odds are one over 100. And so uh, if you uh, if you look at the distribution of uh, the, the, the bias factors and the quantiles in multiple realizations of the catalog, you see that while you can still have uh, large quantiles approaching one, you almost never have a bias factor that goes below the critical threshold of minus two. And so reporting, uh, reporting bias factor is more robust in this sense that bias factor provides a weaker evidence against the null hypothesis than uh, the corresponding quantile might suggest. And then the other key point is that we also simulated a scenario in which we vary the SNR and we vary, and so we vary the uncertainties uh, across the events. And, and we did this to check that uh, whether this feature could, could, could be mitigated by selecting only higher SNR events. So for example, we only select selected events with uh, SNR larger than 50, but as you, which, which here corresponds to the green distribution. But as you see, uh, the problem is basically, it, it remains unchanged. It doesn't depend on the fact that you are stacking a lot of low SNR events uh even if you just restrict yourself to the higher scenario events you would still have the same effect uh, and then uh and so besides sorry besides reporting the bias factor uh, alongside the quantile uh, we also suggest that you bootstrap uh, your uh, catalog to uh uh, to provide an estimate, a conservative estimate, I would say, of the variance uh, of uh, your uh, statistical uh, uh, measure of non of deviation from GR. Like, for example, suppose that you have a catalog and this is a single catalog, you can you cannot generate another catalog. So what you would do is to bootstrap the only catalog that you have. So you would resemble from the catalog with repetition. And so this provides catalogs that are similar, but not exactly equal to the only one that you are observing. And then this would provide you a proxy for the variance of the catalog. And uh, this, this basically, this is an alternative to splitting the catalogs. Uh, since you can split the catalogs, you can resemble from the catalog with repetition and still have uh, it is like an, an estimate of how uh, your reported value of bias factor or quantile uh, would vary by resembling the catalog. And here you see the green distribution corresponds to uh, to this case in which uh, GR was correctly, say, identified as GR. And, and even after you bootstrap, uh, you remain consistent with GR and uh, in, the, in particular, this report 90% uh, confidence interval on the bias factor, and you see that it is roughly between zero and 1.5. So you are definitely not violating the null hypothesis. And then the red distribution corresponds to 
this case here, uh, where the quantile was uh, computed as 0 0.98. And then after you bootstrap, uh, so first of all, you see that at 90% confidence, the quantile can be uh, constrained to be larger than 0 0.7. But 0.7 is not worrisome. I mean, you wouldn't claim anything by 0.7. If, of course, you would start to worry if you are approaching one, so 0 0.98, 0 0.99. But 0.7 is not uh, worrisome. So already at the level of uh, the quantile, you find that you you there is still room for the GR to be correct, and, and and maybe you are just biasing yourself because you have an unlock an unlucky realization of the catalog but at the level of bias factor it is even more clear that uh, this can make your uh, uh, rebuttal of gr uh, uh, let's say less less prone to cosmic variance because after you bootstrap your catalog you find that only a tail of the bootstrapped distribution of uh, of the bias factor is below minus two which is the critical, say, uh, threshold for uh, deciding against the null hypothesis. And, and the bulk of the distribution is above minus two uh, in log, log scale. But uh, more importantly, uh, there is, a, there is co a consistent support for the bias factor to be, to even to be, to be positive, I mean, to favor uh, GR, which, I mean, I recall it was the correct underlying hypothesis, but it was badly recovered as non-GR. So, uh, yeah, I think uh, that's all. And thank you. And if you have any questions. All right. Uh, thank you, Constantino, for this very interesting talk. Uh, do we have any questions? Uh, I have uh, probably... Uh... Uh, more general questions. So, so it's nice that we can stack all these events. But on the other hand, we expect there is some event with uh, very large SMRs, those golden events, right? Like, uh, I just wonder if you test GR just with these golden events versus these stacked low SMR events, like how much improvement you will get using these stacked events, like would that be a factor of two or three or 10? You mean if you test only with the golden events without yeah, yeah. stacking, yeah. Yeah. is what yeah. you mean? Yeah. I think that the approaches are competitive with each other. So for example, if you look at, this, at these numbers and at this plot, you see that if you only use the highest scenario events, this this is a bunch of events that would give you uh, uh, an uncertainty that is roughly here. So it is at the percent level. Uh, but you can reach the same level of constraint by stacking um, uh, these many events, like 10,000 10, or 20,000 of events, that each of, each of which has an uncertainty of 10%. So if you convolve the, the, these events have uh, a, a much higher uncertainty, but they are much, uh, many more, uh, you would reach competitive level of constraint. Uh, then it's true that if you stack, you are exposed, for example, to this problem of variance, but you are exposed to the problem of variance even with single very loud events, and it is just the variance due to the noise. Uh, even if you, if you take a, a single event, which has uh, a very large SNR, even in that case, you have a variance that is the statistical variance due to noise. So you would have, I think that the, these two approaches are competitive. I wouldn't say that one is better than the other. I, I, I think that they should be carried on at the same at the same level. Okay, cool. Thank you. All right. Well, if not, then uh, we'll take a break for a few minutes uh, and we'll return at 10 past the hour. Okay, uh, the next talk is by uh, Rafael Mignon, Mignon Reese. Um, I, I, so this one is actually a, um, a pre-recorded talk. And so I will play this, um, uh, I'll, I'll share my, my screen and, and play this video. 
Um, I don't think that we have anyone here to take questions for them, um, but if you have questions, uh, feel free to reach out to them via email. Um, let me see. So um, hello, everyone. Uh, first of all, thanks to the organizers for giving me the, the opportunity to, to give this uh, presentation. Uh, my name is uh, Raphael Mignoris. I'm a postdoctoral fellow from the French uh, Space Agency, the CNES. Uh, and today I will be presenting the work that is, we have been uh, carrying with my collaborators, mainly at the Astroparticle and Cosmology Lab uh, in Paris, uh, to study the accretion onto pre-merger binary black holes to try to predict uh, what could be their electromagnetic uh, signatures that in the future we can uh, hopefully detect the, uh, gra the, the gravitational waves and the electromagnetic counterpart associated with the merger of binary black holes. Uh, in this talk, I will mainly focus on what happens uh, quite far from the binary, in the, in the outer part of uh, the circumbinary disk, uh, in the so-called uh, radiation zone or wave zone in which the gravitational waves uh, propagate. And by studying the effect of the binary black hole, in particular, the effect that are uh, connected with the, em the emission of gravitational waves, I will uh, show you that actually we don't have to choose between gravitational waves and electromagnetic uh, observations, because actually uh, we can uh, study the impact, the indirect impact of the gravitational wave onto the accreting gas, and this leads an imprint onto the gas that could be potentially detectable. So first of all, um, why are we interested in the electromagnetic counterpart of uh, binary black holes? Uh, what do we need also for such a detection? Well, naturally, since uh, black holes do not emit light, we need them to be embedded in a gas-rich uh, environment. And since we think that most galaxies host a supermassive black hole at the center, the merger of two galaxies uh, should be associated with the merger of the central black holes. And in particular, very importantly, uh, it should it should be accompanied with uh, an emission of electromagnetic waves because the the the, the medium is expected to be gas rich thanks to the galaxies. Uh, then, if we could detect the gravitational wave and the electromagnetic counterpart, what could we learn? What we could learn at the same time on the mergers of galaxies and black holes across uh, cosmic times. We could also make progress of, on cosmology and uh, uh, fundamental physics issues. For example, we could constrain the speed of gravity uh, and therefore test uh, GR. Uh, and for also astrophysical uh, uh, aspects, we could uh, even, if we, if we could detect the system prior to merger, we could follow the system um, prior to merger in electromagnetic waves and therefore possibly witness the, the activation or reactivation of uh, an AGN, an active galactic uh, nucleus. So that all of these topics are very interested and they motivate the need to uh, understand a bit better how does the gas, the accretion gas, uh, reacts to the presence of a, a binary black hole at the center and whether it uh, leaves any uh, detectable electromagnetic signal. So to study this, uh, we uh, follow the evolution of uh, an accretion disk around the binary black hole and, and to do so we use the GR AMAVA code which is a, a typical uh, GR MHD um, code and a natural question is how to take into account the gravity uh, there are several possibilities some are cheaper than, than others for example if you uh, just consider Newtonian gravity it's very practical it's cheap it's um, it allows you to follow the system for very long time scales and therefore to has to, uh, to have a good idea about about how does the the gas react to the presence of the binary but you lose any GR uh, effects and uh, as I will show you actually the 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 um, phenomenon that I will present uh, is uh, not reproducible with Newtonian uh, gravity. An alternative is to solve fully the Einstein's equation so that you have a binary black hole and then at each time step of the simulation you not only solve the, the equation of, the, of evolution of the fluid but also of uh, the Einstein's equations and therefore you obtain the metric at each, each time step but it's very computationally expensive and you can typically only follow the late stages of the merger where everything happens so fast that you don't need uh, long iteration times for the, the system. So we chose an alternative, which is actually to implement a post-Newtonian approximate analytical binary black hole spacetime into our code. 
So if you are interested in this, uh, you can take a look at this at this paper. Just to show you uh, how it is. So basically, we have uh, the, the uh, space time, which is uh, cut into several uh, regions, um, where you are close, moderately close to the black holes, and and the gas can see basically the influence of each of the black holes. Uh, this is the so-called near zone, and in the zone I will focus on today is the so-called uh, far zone or radiation zone or wave zone in which you basically have a Minkowski space-time with just outgoing gravitational waves. And that's why we will we will uh, study the indirect impact of the gravitational waves onto the gas. Uh, just to show you uh, what the metric uh, looks like, uh, this is quite terrible. It's just like one term of uh, the metric. And if you want one point to compare with, uh, the Schwarzschild metric would, uh, would be basically only the first uh, term here, here we have all of these terms just for black hole one and the same for black hole two. But even though it, it seems uh, much more computationally expensive than the Schwarzschild metric, it's uh, it's still much cheaper than solving the full uh, Einstein's equation. So using this type of metric uh, in my team, we we try to predict what could be the electromagnetic signatures from accreting premature binary black holes, uh, and we've been studying uh, two. The effects in two zones of uh, the circumbinary radius. The uh, inner regions, where you will have very non-axisymmetric uh, structures, uh, as can be uh, as can be expected naturally, even in Newtonian gravity. Uh, so, if you are interested in those aspects, uh, feel free to take a look at this paper. But in this talk, I will mostly focus on the work that we have been uh, carrying to to uh, basically uh, see in the outer parts of the circumbinary radius, so further away from the binary black hole than a gravitational wavelength, uh, what happens to the gas uh, there, and is there any impact of the gravitational waves onto the matter? And uh, to do that, so we have uh, used the far zone metric, and we basically encountered kind of, kind of an unexpected behavior on some components uh, of the metric. So here you have the, the lapse uh, scalar as a function of the, the radius, so basically distance to the center of mass of the binary black hole. Uh, and the lapse derivative is basically the GR equivalent of the gravitational potential. That it tells you how the uh, gravity is uh, locally, uh, even in the Newtonian uh, point of view. And here you have, uh, so you can see that uh, very far from the binary black hole, we recover the Schwarzschild uh, lapse. So basically, it's it seems like, at first sight, the gas that is located uh, far away from the binary black hole cannot tell whether at the center it's a binary black hole of a given mass or the same mass but um, carried by only one single Schwarzschild black hole. But what we can see is that actually, if we are in the far zone, here we, we plot the, the derivative of the lapse, so that's directly the gravitational force, or the gravitational force equivalent, but it's GR, and we can see these uh, oscillations uh, that are actually, so you can see that they are uh, in phase opposition, depending on the, the angle. So basically, if you take it a uh, look in, in 2D, it's a spiral. The, the This shape that we see on the equivalent of the gravitational force, it's a spiral that is like very similar to, to this. And actually, it's uh, due to retardation uh, effects. The, the gas that is located uh, here, so further than a few hundred of uh, units of M, so the gravitational radii typically, um, it sees the binary as the binary was in the past. So that in the end, the, retar the retardation effect leaves an imprint onto the uh, the local gravitational force that the gas uh, feels. Na naturally, you could say, okay, but if I just take a Newton gravitational potential, I can also mimic the retardation uh, in the force, and does it lead to the, does it lead to the same uh, effect? But actually, it doesn't. So we plot here the the comparison, the deviation uh, compared with the Schwarzschild metric of um, of this lapse derivative. Uh, in blue, you have what you would get with the Newtonian gravitational uh, potential with retardation. In red, you have the terms of the, the only term of the metric that we think is responsible for this term. And in, 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 uh, in dotted orange, uh, line, you have the, the, the approximate binary black hole metric that we see that there is one particular term of the metric that is responsible for this. 
Uh, and what you can see is that it's not, it cannot be reproduced by a simple Newton retarded potential. So it's a, a purely GR uh, effect. So now what, let's see what is the uh, impact of this onto the gas dynamics, which is uh, on the gas dynamics, but the gas located in the outer part of the circumbinary disk. So to study this, we, we use, uh, we, we have uh, as initial conditions an axisymmetric uh, disk which is close to radial equilibrium uh, and we will follow the spiral of the central binary black hole from uh, 15 gravitational radii down to 8 and we just exclude the inner region of the circumbinary disk to uh, to focus on what happens in the outer disk and here what i show is uh, the deviation of the density compared with the, the initial density, so that any structure that you see appearing here is a consequence of the binary black hole metric, in particular of the deviation between the binary black hole metric and the Schwarzschild metric. And you can see that there is the formation of an m equal to uh, spiral with an alternance of negative and positive uh, sign of the density uh, deviation. And uh, actually it, it, it propagates, uh, but, but the, the structure is actually quite steady it's just that you you can uh, observe that there are some uh, variations along uh, the spiral. And here on the right, I show the the same deviation with respect to the initial uh, density as a function of time for various mass ratios and uh, spin parameters. And I plot the the maximal deviation within the spiral. So that it, it's kind of the the amplitude of the effect. What you can see is that it just increases with time. For uh, more than ten orbits, then we we are uh, we are forced to stop the simulation because uh, down to uh, a certain uh, orbital separation, the post Newton uh, approximation is not valid anymore. But on this portion of the trajectory, we see that there is um, an increasing amplitude of the effect as a function of time. So it's it's very uh, interesting, but it's just so far an effect. A small effect, as you can see here, a small effect onto the gas, but does it translate into observables? So to study this, we have to post-process those uh, simulation outputs with the GeoTo code, the general relativity retracing uh, code, with the same binary black hole metric. But actually, the most of the effect that we will see here is due to uh, the direct effect onto the gas rather than uh, the, the effect of the binary black hole metric onto the photon trajectory. And we use a simple uh, thermal emission model so that what we will see is mostly due to the density distribution of the gas. And to obtain this type of, um, of uh, emission maps, we need to integrate the geodesics of the photons on a long period because uh, naturally the, the metric moves actually as the photons propagate. So we actually need something like 10 orbital periods to obtain such uh, uh, an emission map that we will that will be seen by a distant uh, observer, and this is what you get. Uh, this is the flux uh, divided by its mean value as a function of time, and uh, for two inclination uh, angle values, you can see that there is uh, a modulation of the light curve that is uh, that increases when we increase the inclination angle, and this is uh, the the, the the period of the, mod the modulation is actually the semi-orbital period, so it's totally consistent with the fact that it's uh, due to the retardation, the impact of re the retardation effects onto the gas. Uh, and what what uh, what is suggested by uh, this uh, plot is that the high inclination angle systems are optimal to detect this electromagnetic uh, signature. Then let's take a look at a uh, less idealized system than the equal mass non-spinning uh, system. Uh, so here we changed the, the the mass ratio, and actually the trend is basically the same. Uh, what changes when you change the the the, uh, the mass ratio is not the direct effect uh, that we we observe, because actually this effect is due to uh, let's say to variations of density along the spiral, which is which seems to be quite independent actually onto the the mass ratio. Naturally, what will change, and that's what we will observe also in the spinning case, is that uh, if you vary the spins and if you vary the mass ratio, actually what changes is that the in spiral time changes and therefore the effect that you see will be uh, integrated over shorter or longer uh, timescales. And if, if we can follow 
the flux for uh, long enough time scales, we see that actually there is a small, a slight increase of the effect uh, with time, which means that uh, here we are, we have integrated the effect onto a small portion of the tra trajectory, but actually if we could follow it on much uh, longer portions of the trajectory, it's possible that in the end this effect could be observable. So to conclude uh, on this work, we have uh, studied the gas which is located in the far zone around uh, uh, pre-module binary black holes, and we have shown that retardation effects that are uh, not reproducible in Newtonian gravity, but which are associated with the emission of gravitational waves, they create those weak spiral structures in the plasma density, and that because of uh, this structure and because of the variation of density along those structures, there is actually a modulation of the electromagnetic light curves in thermal uh, emission. The amplitude is uh, rather weak, but it's, it's not surprising because we're talking about uh, an effect that is associated with, gra with gravitational waves. So we are expecting something with, which has a, a small amplitude, but uh, we integrated the system for a short portion of the trajectory so that there is some hope that this effect could, be, uh, could um, uh, reach observable values uh, if it's integrated for much longer uh, time scales. And what this work shows is that um, the only presence or uh, production of gravitational waves emitted by binary black holes, it itself produces an electromagnetic counterpart. And if you are interested in uh, the presentation of our code and the application of this uh, phenomenon to uh, the binary, the supermassive black hole uh, binaries, can take a look at uh, this paper from 2022, uh, published in MNRAS, and feel free to chat with me in the, in, either in the um, in the Amaldi uh, chat on the website or to send me uh, a mail. And if you are interested uh, in the innermost regions of the circumbinary disk rather than the outer region, feel free to take a look at uh, this paper uh, also. And uh, thanks a lot for, for your attention. Okay. Um, yes. Yeah, so please feel free to uh, to message uh, uh, to message Raphael if if you're interested in or if you have if you have questions for them. Um, all right. So next up uh, we have Samson Long. Uh, so please go ahead and and uh, share your screen here. Um, so, hello everyone, I'm Samson, uh, from the China, an undergraduate student from the Chinese University of Hong Kong, and today I'd like to share a work I did with Juan, which is to uh, study the environmental effects on binary black holes uh, for the case of a scalar field bubbles, and whether see whether the such uh, its effect is detectable at all. So, uh, a bit of motivation. So, uh, the fact that we are here already tells us that the universe is not vacuum. So, and from a little bit of astrophysics, uh, it tells us that uh, black holes usually forms in environments, uh, it could be formed in environments with clouds, dust, gas, or galaxies, or this kind of environments. So, in general, we shouldn't expect binary black holes to form always in vacuum. And then uh, this kind of environments would induce some kind of effect on the binary merger itself. And it's a, just a matter of time before we can see this effect. So, uh, as a good starting point to study this environmental effect, we choose to uh, have a massive scale field bubble as a background for, uh, for it being the simplest type of matter, both theoretically and computationally. So now, let's talk about uh, what kind of effects do we expect to see in the first place. So, given a massive scale field, uh, the black hole would accrete the mass uh, onto itself and in terms of making it more massive. In general, any type of environmental matter, uh, as long as it's massive, would induce the same effect. So now that we have a more massive black hole, it means that the uh, during the mass, during the spiral stage is that different from the, that in the merger stage. And this kind of change in mass would reflect in the frequency content of the waveform. Uh, specifically here, I show you a plot of our uh, scale of your waveform as compared to the vacuum waveform in gray. So you can see here in blue, the peak to peak distance uh, is a bit longer for the blue curve as compared to the gray one, which means that it has a longer wavelength and therefore a lower frequency as we expect for a, a more massive black hole. 
uh, in the rain down part. Then uh, the second effect is the so-called dynamical friction. Uh, it has been, there have been previous phenomenological studies that have studied this effect. And there was also a talk two days ago by Giada studying similar effects. And essentially the fact that we have a scale field bubble surrounding the binary, meaning that means that it can carry energy away from the binary uh, through this channel. And therefore the binary orbits shrink a bit faster. Uh, in terms of making the merger accelerated, and generally it would result in a shorter waveform in general. As you can see uh, here on the right, uh, I take a plot from the other study showing um, a scale field of different density, of increasing density. Uh, you will notice that the waveform generally is shorter. Now, uh, so far what I've mentioned to you are effects that rely on the in spiral. So without the in spiral, you wouldn't ex you wouldn't see these effects. However, uh, the fact that we have the scale field in place would actually alter the conservative and dissipative dynamics, meaning that the binary evolution itself would be altered. Now, these evolutions, uh, this change in evolution will leave an imprint in the waveform morphology, especially in the high harmonics. Now, uh, this is incredibly useful because this harmonics present not only in the in spiral part, but more prominently in the merge and rain down part. Now, if we look at the rain down of a black hole, uh, it has several parameters, with, such as the damping time and the characteristic frequencies. Those depends on the final black hole only, so nothing particular. However, the amplitude and phase depends on how the black hole was evolved. So um, if the black hole uh, was from a scalar field environment and evolution is altered, then you would expect that the, uh, the rain down modes would excite in a different way, meaning that these coefficients would be different. And on the right, I just show you uh, the, the in dash is the vacuum, uh, rain down and the in solid is the solid uh, is a six scalar uh, rain down part. And you can see that they don't match entirely and the amplitude is a bit off as well. So with these, uh, before I show you the result of study, let's talk about the analysis setup. Um, so what we have is LR simulations. Uh, we have the Newman Penrose scalar simulations of our binary black hole. Uh, sitting inside a scalar field bubble. And then we take this uh, SIFO, inject into our detectors. In this case, it's the LVK detector network. And then what we get is the SIFO in the detector frame. So now that we have the data, uh, which is the uh, simulations of a scalar field binary black hole with a scalar field amplitude ranging from zero to one, uh, meaning from vacuum from, uh, to a substantial amount of scalar field, then we have two models. So one uh, for recovery, we have two models. Uh, one is a vacuum binary, the other one is scalar field binary. So uh, under a Bayesian framework with two hypotheses, what we can do is a border selection. So uh, the Bayesian, the output from Bayesian inference is this thing called a base factor, which characterizes how much does the data support our model. So in this case, it would be the model of vacuum binary or the model of scalar field binary. Now, uh, then what we do is to take the ratio of these two base vectors. Um, sorry, one second, it's stuck. One second, sorry. Yes, we take the ratio of these two base vectors. And what it tells us is that um, whether the data support our scalar field, uh, model more or the vacuum uh, model more. As you can imagine, if the scalar field induce effects that is uh, very dramatically different from a vacuum binary, then the support for the vacuum model would be lowered and therefore this beta would increase. And on the other hand, if, if the scalar field doesn't induce any observable effects, then uh, this, this whole ratio tends to one. And later on, we will report this uh, parameter in log scale. Then uh, let's move on to the variables of our study. Uh, so in our study, we change the loudness of the signal uh, for this range of SNRs so that we can quantify when are we gonna ex uh, when are we expecting to see the effect. And then we also change the total mass uh, so as to shift the frequency spectrum. Uh, such, an, such a change would uh, uh, allow us to it, it will affect how much waveform is observed in our detector band. 
as we will see later, it, this is of crucial importance. And finally, we also choose uh, to study two different inclinations because different uh, orientations would have uh, the, the signal from different orientations containing different amount of uh, sorry different most contents. So in phase on binary, it consists of mostly the dominant and quadruple mode, whereas the edge on binary would consist of the full harmonic modes. So essentially, it tells us how much information is contained in the signal. So uh, just to recap, the whole point of mass secretion is to uh, would, uh, would affect the binary by uh, having two different masses during in spiral and after uh, the merger. So uh, for a vacuum binary waveform, it can't fit to such a uh, type of signal because simply because the mass is inconsistent uh, uh, between these two stages. And therefore, uh, when, our, when we do our base vector, it would, it would disfavor over the vacuum binary simply because it can't fit the signal at all. Now, if the system become more massive, as we can see, it will shift the frequency spectrum to the left, and then less of the inspiral signal is present in our data. And if we can't see the inspiral, then we can't really tell if it is inconsistent or not, because simply because we can't do the comparison at all. So the conclusion from this is that we would expect as we increase the mass, the scalar field waveform would become less and less detectable. And if we look at our results, this is exactly the case. Now here on the y-axis, I show you the log beta, which quantify how detectable the scalar field is. And then on the x-axis, I show you the total mass of the binary. And as you can see, as we increase the total mass, uh, this detectability decreases drastically. Um, and uh, because of the reason I've just mentioned, and if we look across different mass ratios, similar effect is observed because uh, generally for higher mass, uh, higher mass ratio binaries, uh, their waveform is shorter. And for the same reason, uh, the, the comparison is lost. So another perspective on this uh, phenomenon is that for very massive binary, if only the merge and rain down part is observed, then a vacuum binary can, also, can simply mimic such a signal by increasing the total mass of itself. And then if we look at the parameter bias, here I show you the fractional mass deviation. You can see that in red, it is a vacuum binary, that the parameter bias in effect for the vacuum simulation, and in blue is the simulation, uh, the data with, um, with the scalar field. And you can see that as the SNR increases, uh, the mass deviation without, in vacuum uh, tends to zero as expected. Um, but with the presence of the scalar field, there is a, a permanent mass offset uh, deviation as even in the unrealistically high SNR value of 100. So it, the, this clear mass offset is a clear indication that the vacuum binary is trying to fit the scalar waveform by increasing its, uh, its mass. I just want to know that here you look, uh, you can see that the red curve is converging a bit faster simply because in this case with 200 solar mass uh, is a less massive binary and it can observe part of the in spiral. And therefore it, it, it has access to a bit more information and therefore convert a bit faster. However, the more crucial difference between this uh, two scenario, 200 and 350 solar masses is on their, um, on the fact that the, the 200 solar mass case can ac have access to the in spiral phase. So, and if you recall this uh, scalar field waveform, uh, because of the accelerate, accelerated merger, the latent spiral part is different from that of a vacuum binary. And uh, a binary, a vacuum binary that has precession in it would also, can also mimic such an effect. And we know that such, a, a, such an effect can also mimic by a precessing binary. And therefore, you can see that in this case, with 200 solar mass, the precession spin is highly biased, even as uh, even if we increase it as we increase the SNR to 100. Whereas in the case of 350, uh, without the spiral, uh, it doesn't the, the inconsistency in the spiral in spiral doesn't matter at all. And you can see that there is no parameter bias uh, induced on other parameters such as this precession spin. So with this, it sort of conclude uh, what happens in the phase on binary case. 
All right, fine. Then let's move on to the edge one case. So uh, uh, just to minutes, recall- Three minutes left. Okay, okay, okay. Yes, thank you. Um, so just to recall, this is the result we have in, in the phase one case. However, as I've mentioned, um, edge one binary have access to higher harmonics and simply by comparing the mode structure of the, of the ring down, can already tell us that something uh, is different in the evolution. And in fact, this is exactly the case because uh, it, you can see this for the edge on results, not only is the, are the points above the threshold, but also uh, there is an increasing trend as we increase the mass. Uh, this is because uh, the, the increasing the mass of the binary would means that the, the intrinsic loudness of the binary also increase. So uh, it reveals more detail of the signal of the waveform and therefore the comparison of the mode structure explain. I just want to point out that um, so, so far what I've shown you is for SNR of 100, which is a little bit unrealistically high and is probably only attainable during the third generation detectors. But uh, the actually the, the boundary case where all of them just barely passes the threshold uh, here is log beta equals five is when the SNR is around 30. It, it can already pass the threshold. So uh, considering that the loudest signal during O3 is this uh, event with an SNR of roughly 26, 6.8. So we can expect that the environmental effect will soon, perhaps uh, will be detectable at some point. So just to wrap up everything, um, the study is trying to probe the environmental effect uh, through the studying a scalar field meta scale field bubble um, and in and we study phase on binaries and we show that uh, it, in order to this, uh, identify environmental effects from a phase on binary it relies mostly on the inconsistent masses in different stages and therefore the inspiral stage is crucial for detection and it only works for low mass binaries uh, with as you know, roughly about 20 but for any more massive binaries, uh, such effect is not ob observable. However, in the edge one binaries, because it has access to the high harmonics and the and simply the presence of the rain down itself can already tell us a lot about the, the environment in general uh, at an SNR 30 can already uh, lead to a substantial uh, distinguishment. So at the end, I just want to point out that uh, this is really just a proof of concept study because uh, at the end of the day, the realistically, the environment is most likely not a scalar view. So for all the results I've shown so far, it's mostly qualitative um, and, and the quantitative numbers will have to uh, wait for the actual uh, more realistic environment estimates. So I thank you for your attention and I welcome for any questions. All right, thanks, uh, Samson, for this. Really interesting talk. Uh, do we have any questions? All right, uh, Jan. Hi, Samson. Thank you for the uh, lecture. Uh, please, I, I know what are Newman Bennell scars and uh, I know what is polarization of gravitation waves, but what do you mean by polarization of Newman Bennell scar C4 or what, what, what did you mean by that? Oh, uh, it simply is decomposing these uh, Newman Bennell scalar into the plus and cross polarizations. Oh, okay. Is it okay. Okay. I, I see. Okay. Thank you. Right. All right. Uh, so I wanted to ask, uh, it seemed to me that you were implying that while frequency and damping time are equal to the ones of the curved black hole, but the Amplitude of quasi normal mode excitations would be different because of the scar cloud. And then yes. I was wondering uh, in principle, since you are considering a black hole in matter, uh, you should also have a deviation in the frequency and the big time because the Reggie Wheeler or Tukowski equation will get additional source terms. So, why are, are you? Are you neglecting them because you have an argument to suggest that they are that these deviations are much weaker than those in the amplitudes 
Um, I don't have a solid argument as to why we, we can sort of neglect them. And I agree that uh, maybe including the source term would also affect the frequency as well. But uh, I would say that the scale view, I think the amplitude, so, well, since the modification to the, uh, because I, I thought the, these two parameters depend solely on the black hole final mass and final spin only. So I, I think that that is why these two parameters would fix uh, mostly. As for modifications by the scale field, I doubt it would be a very strong modification uh, because of the no hair theorem. Um, I'm not sure if this can answer your question. Yeah, yeah, thanks. That was my question. All right. Uh, do we have any any other questions? Uh, Nathan, go ahead. Yeah. So maybe I just missed it, but I'm not sure how you're computing these phase vectors. So you need some model for the scalar case. So how are you computing that? Thank you for your question, Nathan. Uh, so you you raised a very good point. Um, so since we don't have don't really have a uh, scalar field model, like a, a model that encodes a binary black hole in a scalar field. So uh, what we really do here is an approximation using the uh, Alpine K information criterion. Um, I, I don't have this slide here. Uh, we can, if we want, uh, we can talk about this a bit later, but essentially uh, what we do is an approximation um, by studying the, um, so we, we inject a vacuum waveform and then we recover it with a vacuum model. And then we, uh, through the criterion, we add the correction factor to account for the extra parameter in the scale of, in the future uh, scale field model. Um, yeah, so that is an approximation. Okay, thanks. You can we talk yes. on the uh, TGO column Monday so we can discuss more then. Yes, yes, yes. All right, uh, any any other questions? We have time for one more. I actually did have one more question. Yeah, um, which is, so these are fairly small effects. Do you have some idea what the numerical uncertainties in your simulations are? I honestly have no idea because uh, the simulations isn't done by, by myself. Uh, I'm sorry about that. Oh, that's fine. You should but you can authors about this. Sorry, uh, could you repeat your question? I just saying that's fine. You just need to bug your co-authors to give you a uh, email Okay, okay. All right, uh, thanks again, Samson. Uh, and, and after this, we'll, uh, we'll go ahead and take a break uh, for 10 minutes and then we'll start again at the hour. Okay. So, will tell us about gravitational wavelengthing. Um, okay, it's in the first screen. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, so firstly, I would like to thank the organizers for this uh, great opportunity to present in the Maldi. So today, uh, well, good morning or good afternoon or good night, uh, depends on where you are. So today, uh, my name is Jason Poon. I'm from the Chinese University of Hong Kong. I'm working together with Professor Otto. It's also from the Chinese University of Hong Kong. And today I'm going to talk about gravitational wave lens and lens reconstruction. And this project is also in collaboration with uh, Stefano Vinaldi from University of Pisa. So uh, there's a few questions here. Uh, the first one is what's gravitational lensing? Um, the second one is what's lens reconstruction? And then the third one is how is gravitational wave lens reconstruction useful in science application? Sorry. Uh, okay. So, um, sorry. Uh, so uh, let's take a look about the idea of gravitational lensing. So when GM waves or gravitational waves, when they travel in curved space time, they will uh, follow the geodesic and then travel in the band trajectory. And this is what we call gravitational lensing. So we can take a look at the uh, illustration below. So we have a source sitting, a wet source right here. And then we have a, we are observers right here in between us, there's a lens galaxy. 
when the light emits or gravitational wave emitted from this source travels near this lens galaxy, its trajectory will get bent. So from our point of view, we will see the image being located right here. And there may also be another path. And we also see another image being located right here. So in Nansen, it may produce multiple images. They may be distorted in shape. They may be magnified. And they will also have different time delays. They're different arrival times. So it was first verified observationally, almost uh, a little bit longer than 100 years ago. So this is during the solar eclipse, where this is the moon, and behind it is the sun. And then the stars behind, located far behind the sun, is kind of shifted by some angles because of the lensing effect from the sun. So for the, uh, there are some typical lensing system. The first one is the galaxy. So we can look, take a look at this photo right here, where this the, the thing in the middle is the lens galaxy and A and B, they're actually the same, uh, different images of the same source. They come from the same source, so come from the same quasar. And the more complicated one may be a galaxy cluster. So there's a galaxy sitting far behind the galaxy cluster. And then um, this is the observation image where we have a galaxy cluster here. And while around it, you can see a lot of different arcs right here. And these arcs, they are actually highly distorted image of a galaxy that sits you know, far behind the cluster. So let's get to the uh, more theoretical and detailed geometry of lensing. So this is the, where the source is located. And this is where we are. And the distance between the source and the observer is usually very large. And then this is where the lens is. The lens is a 3D lens. But the thing is that the 3D lens, the width of the lens is very short, very small compared to the distance between observer and source. So effectively, we can basically shrink the whole 3D lens onto a 2D mass plane, on, or onto a 2D lens plane. And we call the 2D uh, mass distribution uh, sigma. So it's like we project all the mass on the 2D lens plane. And then all the deflection will happen on this uh, lens plane. So this is the geometry of lensing. So this is where the source is located. It travel emit some GW and then travels near the lens, get banned, and then arise to the observers. And then from the observer point of view, because we see things in a straight line, we see the image being right here. And we denotes the angular image position as theta, the angular source position as beta. And for the lens itself, we can also define something called the Einstein radius, theta e, which is just basically the scale of the lens. So it's like how massive the lens is. And then we can define dimensions, image and source position, S and Y. They are just the image and source position we scaled by Einstein radius. So the system is now in sort of a dimensionless form. And then we can also have the dimensionless lens potential psi uh, here, which actually is a that can be directly calculated from the mass distribution. So psi based based the potential basically represent the mass profile of the lens. And then we uh so we can have the time delay of this uh, of this pathway here because it's it's different from the original straight path that that we expect with our lensing, right? So there's got to be some time delay. So this is the expression for the time delay. Well, outside of the bracket, we have some terms right here. First, we have the redshift. We have uh, some speed of light. We can also have some combination of the angular diameter distances where DL is between observer and lens, DLS is between lens and source, and DS is between observer and source. And then we can also have the Einstein radius here. These terms are coupled together. And then inside the bracket, it only depends on the dimensional system. So the first term right here accounts for the geometry time delay because the the light ray is traveling some extra distance instead of just a straight line. So we have some extra time delay due to that. And the other term psi is the gravitational time delay because it travels near a massive object and then there's some gravitational time dilation. If you if you know the source position and you have the lens profile, you want to solve for the um uh, solve for the image position, what you can do is that you take the gradient of the time delay and then set to zero. So this is basically just finding the stationary points of the time delay, or, you know, it's basically for mass principle, right? And then if you, you can also calculate the magnification of the image. Uh, say you just take the Jacobian, uh, one Y, one S, and then take the determinant and then take the inverse. So again, but this magnification only depends on the dimensionless system. It doesn't depend on the absolute scale of the system. So now let's get a bit more into gravitational wave lensing. Um, 
despite it follows this, almost the same mathematics as CM that I'm saying, but then, you know, observationally, there's some different things. Uh, in GW Lancet, what we see is, uh, well, it's not detected yet, but mathematically, according to GL, it should be there. What we've seen in the detector is that we see repeated signals and they roughly come from the same patch of sky. So we can take a look at the figure on the right hand side. Uh, but the localization of GW is pretty large. So we should see there's a overlapping of localization between uh, all the different images right here, which are encoded in different colors. So there should be all combined overlapping sky localization. And then from the data, uh, what we can see is also a uh, few different images. Let's say here we have two images, two lens images from the same source. They should have the same waveform, but uh, they may have different amplitude because of they went through different amplification during the lensing and they arrive at different times. So now we can measure two things. The first is the effective luminosity distance of the image, uh, DL effective, uh, which is just the original luminosity distance modified by some by the magnification during lensing. So what we measure is this whole combination of the two things. Another thing is the relative time delay of the images. So it's basically just the arrival time difference, delta TD of the two images. So what we try to do in lens reconstruction is that we try to use uh, these lensing observables, the measurements, the effective numerosity distance, the time delay to reconstruct the mass profile. Uh, often we can assume some rather simple Gaussian lens model, say maybe a singular isothermal, uh, ellipsoid SIE, so it's elliptical. Uh, it's you know it's well tested in a lot of a few uh, for a few decades in EM lensing. Uh, the mass profile is given by this expression, uh, where uh, characterized by two parameters f and v, where f is the SS ratio, v is the velocity dispersion. So what we try to do is we try to infer the value of f and v, and we also try to infer the some source information, say maybe the luminosity distance without that that's without lensing in the case, and also the the source position beta. Where does it sit behind the lens? So on the way, this is a, a simple illustration where we ingest some value and have some uh theoretical lens observables. Then we try to use the injective theoretical observables to try to obtain the lens profile back. So green cross is where we inject the sources. And this bright dark color bar is the uh, inferred mass profile. So this is the density the color bar represents. And then there's four patches right here. They are the um, uh, posteriors for the image positions. And the colors represent the inferred magnifications of that image. Uh, but what's the... Sorry. Uh, but what's the important thing about lensing in science application? So. First, we can do a, so I've selected some samples here. So first is the sub second localization of the BBH merger. So with uh, BBH merger emission GW, but the sky localization is like orders of degree squares. But now if it is lensed, then we can look at that same sky region and search for the EM, the corresponding EM lens system there. And then we can do lens reconstruction and compare the EM lensing and GW lens system and see if they agree with each other. And in a more um, optimal case, we may be able to narrow it down to one galaxy or maybe a few most, a, a few candidates at most. And if you narrow it down to one candidate galaxy only, then you can even do a further detailed, detailed lens modeling and lens reconstruction to see where does the BBH come from inside the whole galaxy. So, um, but this relies on GW lens reconstruction. We also rely on uh, some EM lens reconstruction. The other thing is Hubble constant measurement. Uh, we assume we know the redshift of the lens and also the source, maybe from the sub second localization that we did before. Then you recall that the luminosity distance and the angular diameter distance, they are both functions of uh, redshift and Hubble constant. And these two things, the luminosity distance and angular diameter distance, we can also infer them for lens reconstruction. So if we infer the value of uh, the luminosity distance and angular diameter distance, and we know the redshift, then we can easily solve for the Hubble constant. So this graph on the right hand side here, uh, the black curve is actually the um, an Bayesian analysis of combining the uh, Hubble constant inferred from the luminosity distance and angular diameter distance. And we can say it's pretty close to the injected value in this orange dashed line. And we can also test the modified gravity field. 
So modified gravity affects the propagation of gravitational wave, such that in a way that the GW luminosity distance and the EM luminosity distance, this ratio is supposed to be one without modified without modified gravity. But with modified gravity, is characterized by the uh, by the parameter C naught right here. So now, uh, so there's a difference. So now, if you assume that you also know the redshifts, then you can do some analysis. Um, we expect that if you do lensing, then you may, if there's modified gravity, say maybe C0 equals to 1.8, then the luminosity, EM luminosity distance and the GW luminosity distance in the orange and blue curve respectively, they should not agree with each other. They should be offset by significant amount, right? So now how do we do lens reconstruction to sort of help this, help to analyze this? Well, uh, we call that the effective luminosity distance that we measure in GW lensing uh, related to the GW uh, lens, uh, GW luminosity distance in color blue right here. And but for the time delay, uh, it encodes some information about the angular diameter distance, which in turn is directly related to the EM luminosity distance. So now in the same lensing system, we are able to pull both EM luminosity distance and GW luminosity distance at the same time. So we and but then we have to you know we you have to invert this value GW and EM luminosity distance for some uh, lens reconstruction because there's some modifications and time delay factors that's modified it. So lens reconstruction loss is also needed to test uh, this uh, modified gravity field. But there's some problem. Uh, which is something called a similar, similarity transformation degeneracy, which happens in GW lensing, uh, which is the case when we don't have redshift information, so we don't know the angular diameter distance, and we also don't know where the images are precisely because the localization is uh, power is limited. So now we recall that the time delay is given by this expression, where the red term right here, I call it the time delay scaling, D delta T, is combined information of redshift angular diameter distance, where, uh, which is where the Hubble constant and redshift also enters into it through the angular diameter distance and also the Einstein radius, the scale of the lens. And the blue term right here is fully dimensionless. I call it the dimensionless time delay. Only depends on dimensionless quantity. It doesn't depend on the actual scale of the lens. So very different lens, they can have the same dimensionless time delay if the, the combination is right. And then also the modification only depends on the dimension of the system. So now the thing is, if you measure the time delay, you will not be able to separate or resolve anything inside this red term. You can only measure the whole value of D delta T. And then, uh, which means that the Einstein radius, the ratio of the source lens and Hubble constant, they are coupled and can be resolved. So this is one illustration of two lens, very different lens system. The left one is a smaller lens, but it has a larger distance between the source lens and Earth. The second one on the right is a larger lens, but has a very short distance between Earth lens and source. The thing is that they, through, through some lucky combination, they can actually give you the same modification, same time delay scale D delta T, which means also the same uh, image time delay. So with GW alone, without any EM lensing information, you cannot separate between these two cases. So, if we include the degeneracy again, uh, this is the effective of two observables, effective noise distance characterized by uh, DL divided by magnification and the time delay is time delay scaling multiplied by the uh, dimensions time delay. And what we can only infer will in, in let's say using SIE model in GW lens alone, we can only infer the dimensions image and source position the SIE SS ratio F, and also we can only infer the value of the luminosity distance and also the value of the time delay scaling, but we cannot resolve anything that's, uh, you know, that makes up these two guys. So what we're trying to do right here is actually, we try to do a lens reconstruction algorithm in Bayesian framework. We try to have a stable and efficient uh, algorithm. So now I ingest some data into my model. So ingest some reshifts. Uh, in just the SS ratio of 0 0.8, also some velocity dispersion. And then for the likelihood, I assume a 10% Gaussian error on the measure time delay and effective velocity distance, um, which probably accounts for the uh, error on the uh, on the model and also detectors. 
So now this is the inferred image positions of the all four images. So we see uh, the cost is the injection value. And if you enlarge it, you can see the posterior for the first image. So we see the image position is pretty accurate. And then right here for the graph at the, at the bottom, we can we infer the value of the luminous distance and the time delay scaling. So we see the value of the time delay scaling on the top is okay. Uh, the luminosity distance is also not bad. And the access ratio, we recovered it to be very close to the injection value. Uh, we notice that there's a second peak right here, but that's just some local uh, local measurement. That course, because we are assuming a pretty large uh, area of the measurements in the light. So there's some limitation with GW lens alone, we can only infer the velocity distance and time delay scaling, but you cannot, there's a couple of Einstein ratio where the Hubble constant is still there. But the thing is that with some degree of EM information, or maybe, you know, if you got the whole EM lens system, then it's, it's even better. They can be decoupled. Say if you know the redshifts and if you know the Hubble constant from EM observation, you can actually infer H not the Hubble constant. So this is what we did with the same uh, injection one from last page. So we we're able to recover the Hubble constant after we, you know, we have the we set that we know the redshifts and the core Einstein radius. So the conclusion is that GW laser is not detected yet. But now we are trying to develop, we're trying to prepare for it. We're trying to have stable and efficient lens with construction algorithms. Along it suffers from some coupling of Einstein radius, redshift and Hubble constant. But if we combine GW and EM lensing, you know, you can break this degeneracy and have the Hubble constant measurement. And the thing is that this lens reconstruction is useful for further science case. Let's say sub R second of localization of BBH merger, also uh, test, testing of modified gravity. But currently there's still some obstacles because uh, firstly is the marshy degeneracies, which may bring slightly uh, biased H0 uh, measurements. Another thing is substructure and actual lens. Uh, this is the smooth lens model that we'll use. And but in the actual case, if we have some dark beta subhalos or some substructures nearby, which will solve perturbation and modifications a bit, which brings some errors in the analysis. This may be some articles obstacles, but they can also bring in some new science, maybe dark matter studies, but this is definitely something that we have to work on, we have to account for. Uh, so this is the end of my talk. So um, thank you very much for listening. Uh, thank you for a nice talk. Um, does anyone have any questions or comments? You can just unmute or you can raise your hand. Okay, maybe, maybe I will ask the first question. So, how do you know if it's a lens to gravitational waves or um, gravitational waves from two um, sources that are just close to each other? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, basically, uh, wait a second. Okay, so firstly, they if they're lensed, uh, well, if they're close to each other, then you, you have to look at the waveform. If you look at the waveform, and they are uh, you know, to some error margin. If they totally don't agree with each other, let's say one the the resident mark, term mass is different, then you know they're not less. But if they're you know if the, the whole waveform is look is looking super similar, you know, through the Bayesian analysis, even if it tells that, you know, it looks like a lens event, but it still may not be, then that's the case where there's a false alarm. And people actually try to also quantify this false alarm rate. So there's a possibility that this will this will happen, but okay. the probability is not so not really that high. I think there's a lot of literature about. It. Thank you. Is there any any other questions? Okay. If not, let's thank the speaker, Jason. Thank you very much. Nice yeah. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Okay. Um. So the sep second speaker canceled the talk. So let's go ahead and go to the third speaker. All right. Um. Hi everyone. Um, again, um, thanks again for I mean thank the organizer again for you know holding this talk and also thank everyone for being here in the very last section, uh, very last talk of this section as well. My name is Vincent. Um, I'm a PhD student at the University of Virginia. Uh, this is my project with my advisors, Professor Kent Yagi and Phil Aris. So in this talk, I'm going to talk about testing GR using double wave wolf systems through gravitational wave observations. 
Um, okay. Right. So to begin with, um, just gonna um, have a little bit of some previous work, actually our major reference work by Littenberg and Yunus published in 2019, which they're the first one to um, raise the idea of using galactic binaries to test non-GR theories. In particular, I'm here showing one piece of their results by applying their study on a, a specific form of massless scalar tensor theory with a minus one post newtonian order and a, a specific conformal coupling uh, function in this form. Basically, in the GR limit, we have alpha naught and beta naught to be zero. And they're testing whether we can use gravitational wave signals to place constraint on the parameter space formed by this alpha naught and beta naught. And just to jump to their conclusion, what they find is that uh, these galactic binaries, surprisingly, can place um, complementary or maybe even better bounds than the existing pulsar bounds or maybe solar system test shown in this figure. And that depends on how much we know about the masses and the radius of the individual binary through independent measurements. So in their assumption, they assume that we also have electromagnetic counterparts detected in the future, maybe, for some of these systems. So for the tightest um, prior, they impose like 0.01% error on the mass. They're able to place a really tight constraint that is uh, even more sensitive than the currently existing pulsar constraint plus the solar system. Uh, measurements. However, as they also pointed out in their study, they also they only considered point masses um, a contribution to the gravitational wave signals without considering what we call astrophysical effects. That is, the finite size of these stars can cause it to uh, have extra contribution to the orbital decay rate that can affect the result. And this is exactly what we do in this project. We want to focus on the astrophysical effects and ask a question how it can affect the conclusion. So um, start from the very beginning um, about a method. We consider circular double white wolf binaries uh, uh, systems, which gives what we call the quasi monochromatic signals. That is the signal is uh, more or less monochromatic. The frequency changes by a very tiny little bit over a long uh, time. That means if we want to measure the orbital decay rate, that requires us to have a long observation time of the signal. And in our waveform, we consider a nine parameters model that includes the sky position, the phase, the gravitational waves, and also the frequency, frequency changing rates. We expand the phase uh, as a Taylor series as the um, initial uh, frequency and the frequency changing rate and so on. With that, we can impose our non-GR effect through the post uh, parameterized post-Einsteinian uh, model, which is the PTE model. Um, that parameterized this non-GR effect through this dimensional uh, parameter gamma, and also it depends on the post-Newtonian parameter U, which is basically the orbital speed of the system. And depending on the theory itself, we have different N, the post-Newtonian order effect of uh, different non-GR theory. So in other words, our ability to place constraint on this non-GR effect depends really on how much, how well we can measure this gamma. And this is restricted by our systematic uncertainty on measuring this uh, parameter as shown, illustrated in this uh, PDF function. Basically, it is how wide our PDF is and uh, for that, we perform a Fisher analysis to obtain this uh, so-called statistical error. Other than that, as I mentioned above, there are also astrophysical contributions. And here we write that as an extra parameter, dimensionless parameter, delta astro, which basically modifies our orbital decay rate uh, by a certain amount. And here we consider several factors that causes this uh, difference. Uh, basically, including the self rotation of the star, tidal interaction, or any other reasons that it has a non zero quadruple movement, and also the magnetic field effect, and so on. 
We assume that in our model, if we have not included this effect, then our measurement on this uh, gamma parameter will have a systematic shift. And this systematic shift is not dependent on the signal to noise ratio itself. That's why we call it systematic error. So um, to illustrate each of these effects, here I'm just uh, briefly showing how this uh, effects enter our equation. Basically, the total energy loss rate of the orbit depends on several factors. First of all, the gravitational wave emission. As gravitational wave is emitted, it causes the orbit to shrink. We also have the rotation effect. Um, since um, white dwarfs are basically spinning, and um, it, as the orbit shrinks, the um, star has to spin, it spin up in order to catch up with the orbital frequency to stay synchronized. And this spinning up causes a uh, dissipation of the orbital, orbital energy into the star itself. Other than that, we also have the quadrupole uh, moment contribution, which can be caused by the tidal interaction, the spin itself, which also helps dissipate energy. And lastly, we also consider the magnetic field effects. Uh, since there are really highly magnetized white dwarfs observed up to date so far, they can go up to 10 to the 9th Gauss, which is a really strong magnetic surface magnetic field. This kind of system, uh, imagine we're having magnetic dipoles uh, from a back moment from these uh, white dwarfs. Uh, the charged particle around is able to establish a closed um, a closed circuit for this between these two uh, between these two stars. And as the stars orbit around each other within a magnetic field, it would generate a uh, electromotive force, which drives a current across this um, conducting layer. And this is what's known as the um, unipolar induction effect um, that is described by the DC circuit model. As the current is driven across this circuit, uh, the resistivity of the circuit causes the um, orbit to dissipate its energy and causes another source of dissipation. These are the astrophysical sources we have considered here. <clears throat> now, um, before I go into the actual numerical results here, I'm just illustrating how large each um, of these astrophysical uh, contribution is. Basically, uh, the above mentioned uh, astrophysical contribution, they all have different uh, frequency dependence. Basically, the magnetic field effect goes as 1.5 post-Newtonian order. And the tidal effect and the spin induced quadrupole moment goes as a 50 and order. And they depend on different uh, astrophysical parameters, for example, the B field, um, the moment of inertia, the tidal deformability that tells us how much the uh, star deforms under the external tidal field. We also have the um, uh, spin orbit, uh, spin induced quadrupole moment that's induced by its own coilless force. As you can see here, if we consider the highest frequency sources, uh, these effects, they have similar uh, orders of magnitude, and we're expecting them to be quite important in the frequency range we are interested in, where we can get the best sensitivity uh, uh, to probe the, um, the, the, the parameter gamma. So now, uh, here comes our first set of numerical results. Basically, um, we perform a Fisher analysis to focus on the statistical error without first considering the astrophysical effects. Here we pick a simulated sources, uh, a simulated source for to perform this uh, Fisher analysis, uh, which has a frequency of uh, 20 millihertz, which is about uh, five times higher than the, um, um, the LISA verification binary with the highest frequency known up to date. Uh, here we're illustrating this um, statistical uncertainty for this source uh, for different post Newtonian order n. Comparing it with the current currently existing bound, for example, the red one here comes from the binary black hole coalescence event GW 150914. You see that this double white dwarf clearly shows an advantage for negative post Newtonian effect that enters in the earlier stage of the in spiral, basically. However, uh, even if we have a large enough SNR, say if we observe it for long enough for six years, uh, it's still uh, 
doesn't match the constraint given by Poulsen measurements. So now, um, let me do better than this. So here, um, I'm just um, giving an example. Here, um, if we impose priors on the mass of the system, let's say, again, like the assumption that Litton Brooks have made, um, let's say if we have a uh, independent measurement on the mass of the system, then we can impose priors on it and probably in, uh, improve the measurements. Just as a reference for the least verification binaries uh, we know up to date, um, the best um, priors we can place on the masses of the system is around the um, order of unity. So if we have that, let's say, uh, we can have better bounds on this um, gamma in terms of the statistical uncertainty. For example, the, the one in the middle here, we assume a 1% prior, and the other one is the 0.01% prior on the mass, which uh, may sound quite unrealistic, uh, but still we're just trying putting it here for a comparison. If that is the case, if we have this kind of ideal situation, then we can probably place better bounds than um, the current existing Poulsen measurements. Um, however, as uh, just, just mentioned, I just mentioned, um, this prior seems a little bit unrealistic for us. Um, so this basically the knowledge independent measurements on the mass is a major um, challenge, one of the major challenges of um, this kind of measurements. So besides that, we also have the systematic error. Now um, here I'm showing the um, um, different types of errors on this gamma uh, as a, a function of the mass ratio of the system because the astrophysical uncertainty, uh, the astrophysical contributions I mentioned above, they all depend on the mass ratio of the system. So I'm here showing this systematic error caused by this astrophysical effects compared against the uh, statistical error that, that I showed earlier in the previous slide, which are illustrated in these dotted lines, horizontal lines here. So for the desired level of sensitivity, we see that all the astrophysical effects is above that line. That means these systematic error here are not um, ignorable or um, they are significant enough to affect our measurement on gap. In other words, in our parameter estimation, we have to include basically all of them, all of these astrophysical effects in order to get a correct measurement for gamma, and that can be challenging itself. So um, here I'm just applying this um, PPE model to a specific theory as an illustration or as an example. Here we apply it to the so-called screen modified gravity, which is a specific class of scalar tensor theory that has so-called screening effect. That means the non-GR effect is only apparent in low density environment. In this specific theory, the non-GR parameter is basically this phi, which is the vacuum expectation value of the scalar field. And it depends on our PPE parameter gamma and also the compactness of the system. For this reason, um, we believe these white dwarfs will be able to place better bounds um, than say uh, neutron star pulsars or maybe uh, black holes due to its lower compactness. And the result is shown here below, which um, is similar to what we had in the previous slide, except that now the statistical uncertainty, they depend on the mass ratio. We compare this with the existing pulsar white wolf bound, which is uh, a similar source as we have here through ENM observation. And we show that um, this, whether this, um, Gravitational waves from galactic binaries are able to place better bound depends actually on the mass ratio as well. So uh, it adds another complication to our analysis because uh, not just the systematic error and the uh, independent measurement of masses, it also depends on the mass ratio. Uh, something um, depends on the source itself. Right, um, so before I end the discussion, yeah, I just, I just want to discuss um, the possibility of including all these astrophysical effects in our parameter estimation. So basically, um, 
what we show is that astrophysical effects are important. We need to include it in our model, but uh, is it possible to perform a uh, parameter estimation uh, up to this accuracy? Um, given that we have that many parameters, because as we showed above, the waveform itself contains very limited information through its space. So uh, if we include too many parameters, there will be a lot of degeneracy. So here we just suggest a few of the solutions. First of all, uh, we have universal relations between these um, astrophysical parameters, for example, the I love Q relation that relates the movement of inertia, the tidal deformability, and the speed induced quadruple movement. This helps us reduce the number of parameters. And other than that, if we are again given independent measurements, then we might be able to pose constraint on these astrophysical parameters. As an illustration, we impose the Gaussian prior on the movement of inertia and perform a 10 parameter um, uh, estimation. And it shows that it gives similar constraint on the gamma compared to the nine parameter case. And that means um, if we are able to have some uh, knowledge of these astrophysical parameters, indeed we can perform a similar level of um, parameter, we uh, can measure it up to a similar level of accuracy. So um, just to conclude what, what, what I have um, uh, shown, Basically, we show that using galactic binaries to constrain non-GR effects can be more challenging as we originally thought. The first major challenge would be the independent measurement of the masses through electromagnetic measurements, which are not always available. Second one, depending on the theory itself, it might depend on some other parameters like the mass ratio, uh, like the screen modified gravity I showed. And lastly, um, accurate modeling of the astrophysical effects are very important. Um, with that, um, just um, end here. And I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Yuyang. Um, is there any other questions or comments? Um, so, so you did this for Lisa, but is there any prospects for like different frequency band like the cycle? Like can you can you resolve astrophysical effects if you use the cycle or something like that? Mm. So there are studies that include um, the frequency range of the cycle, and indeed, um, if we let's say if we ignore the astrophysical effects, the cycle is able to actually give better bounds on these non-GR effects. But if we consider these non-GR effects in the frequency band of the cycle, we can see that these um, effects actually can grow really large um, compared to uh, the millihertz range or 10 millihertz range we're having here. So we're expecting the astrophysical effects will be even more dominant over the um, uh, you know, the um, uh, statistical error we are talking about inside the detectors. I see. So, for example, can you do like you probe astrophysical effects in the cycle and then subtract it from Lisa observation or something like that? Mm -hmm. Measurements between the two. Like, if you, if you detect this with the cycle and Lisa, can you? to put the beta constraints on non-GR effects? Oh, yeah, I think um, that can be another um, like independent measurements of the each individual uh, uh, of the astrophysical effects that allows us to at least like placing priors on them that helps uh, our uh, Lisa measurement as well. Thank you. Is there any other questions or comments from the audience? Okay, if not, let's thank Shuyan again. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. So I think this is the end of the session. And so this was the last session for Amodi. So thank you very much. See you.